You're listening to the What's the Fuzz podcast, where we break you out of your vacuum seal and get down to what's real. Never miss another episode again. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. And now, your host, Reiner. Yo, what's up, fuzzies? Thanks for tuning in for another a week of What's the Fuzz? If it's your first time listening, it's great to meet you. I'm Reiner, and today I'm joined by Mark. Hello! Hey, what's up? On October 4th, 2020. Hopefully we'll be learning a thing or two about the negative stigmas that surround being a furry. <laughs> but hey. <laughs> Before we get into the interview tonight, I just wanted to share some grievances with you guys that I've had the past week, sir. A uh, prominent figure in the Furs of Color community made a claim, which turned out to be incorrect about the definition of what BIPOC meant. While I don't want to draw attention to it, since they've since deleted the claim, and the claims made after defending the year, their incorrect definition after learning what the definition was, I think that the effect it had on the Latino and Asian community brings up an important conversation because while it's easy for furs of color to recognize on one hand you know we're all in this together quote unquote and to share that mentality on one hand uh on the other hand through no fault of their own some communities may not feel as valid as others as a person of color it can be difficult to have conversations that revolve around having thoughts like what if i'm just another shade of white Am I really allowed in the space? I don't want to intrude somewhere I don't belong. If we as a community want to help people heal and move past this, we need to recognize that it takes more than reassurance. For them to be able to understand that, yes, it's valid to feel that way due to the hardships that all people of color go through. Like an open wound, we need to process that pain and understand together. Not split the divide deeper it's not always as easy as a brown person going to a brown space to feel safe BIPOC is more than just skin it's heritage and culture and why your family raised you the way they did and why you feel like you need to seek out people that look like you anyways as I said tonight I'm sitting down with Mark and if you don't know him, he's a gamer and mer You can catch him over at Mark underscore Lee AD. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Mark. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I love the intro. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't want to stay mad about it, but it was kind of a big deal. I yeah. want people to talk about it some more. <laughs> it, it, was, it was like all over Twitter, like everyone that I follow, like, you know, uh, retweeted and then commented the deleted tweet Mm -hmm. you know stuff like that and you know to be honest like i think it's just like another day in and uh on twitter because like there's always some new drama popping up true and i would have loved to call it just drama if this person wasn't kind of juxtaposed on top of us as like a person that we have to kind of look at you know right unfortunate circumstances so i hear you're a bit of a disney fan huh uh yeah i am um god i've pretty much watched almost every animated disney film including like you know the non-animated ones uh i like me and my family we just spent our whole lives just going to the disneyland in anaheim you know, mm. pretty much like once or twice every year. And oh wow, aren't you spoiled? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, kinda in a way. Like, I we don't really, you know, have much money, but we do scrounge up enough money for all of us to go to Disneyland for a few days. All right. Well, surprise, surprise. So am I. And I'd like to ask you an icebreaker in the form of a little lightning round to get us loosened up for the uh, other questions I've got stored for you. All right. So I'm going to name an iconic Disney character, and you tell me their worst enemy. 
Okay. You ready? Let's do it. I'm ready. Mowgli. Shere Khan. Robin Hood. Prince John and the uh, Sheriff of Nottingham. Ooh, bonus points for you. <laughs> Basil. Basil. Um, Radigan. There you go. The cats from Aristocats. Oh, it's uh, Edgar. Oh my God! You remembered his name. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, I remember his, uh, his, his, uh, fav- his uh, favorite milk, the, his special concoction, the creme de la creme de la egg. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one's Bell. Bell. That would be Gaston. Yeah, my man Gaston. <laughs> Look at you. You got all of them right. Congrats. Hey, no one can beat me in a in a trivia. I've tried them all. So my listeners and I would like to get to know you a little bit better. So how old are you? What's your ethnicity? What do you do for work? Are you going to school? And where do you live? Well, currently I live in Fairfield, California, in Solano County. Mm-hmm. And I'm 23 years old. I'm half na- uh half half. No, sorry, half African American, a quarter Native American, a quarter mm-hmm. Greek. So some white in me in there. And mm-hmm. what I do for work is I'm currently a food runner slash cook for a brewery. And I've worked there for about four months now. And I I haven't had a better job than that. What's your main persona? My main persona is Mark Lee. Uh, it it's um my two middle names, because you know, like people think of the craziest names for their personas, and for me, I just did both of my middle initials. I mean, middle uh names, which pretty much sound like a name, anyways. And he is a kitsune, which is a Japanese fox demon, and mostly they have you know, nine tails, but currently Mark has six, but I reduced it to two just, you know, to save all time and art. What's your sexuality slash gender identity? My gender identity is male. Uh, and my sexuality is uh, bisexual. Uh, more mm-hmm. bicurious than bisexual. Like, I've had uh male sexual interactions at uh fursuit parties but mm-hmm. uh i mostly go toward women all right how do you relate to your persona oh gosh uh <laughs> he's basically everything that i want to be you know successful wears his uh, a suit pretty much almost every day. Um, <laughs> he's also like a bit of, he's also like a bit muscular. Like for me, I'm just mm-hmm. a little on the husky side. Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, the 350 pound fat dude, but I'm not like 165 pound muscular guy, but I'm just kind of in between. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like his personality is just that of a classy Victorian personality. Like that's kind of what he is. Is that he's just a gentleman all around. Why do you feel the Victorian draws you in? What's the appeal of it for you? Uh what I miss about that era is that everyone dressed to impress, no matter how poor or how rich you were. Like even about a hundred years ago, during um, I think it was like ten year, like ten years before the Great Depression, but even during the Great Depression, men and women still dressed up in suits and ties, no matter where they went. Hmm. And I missed that, and I I loved the look of it, and so I decided, uh, very early on, I think, 
like right after high school is that I want to have a suit for myself, at least three suits to wear. And that's basically what Mark is. That's what basically drew me in is that I want him to wear a suit because I want to wear a suit every day. You like being classy. Exactly. That's what I, that's what I really love. It's like that classy look, you know, not a lot of people, you know, when you see a lot of people in clubs, you don't see a lot of them dressing up in suits and ties, unless they're, they're getting off work and they're grabbing a couple drinks. If they're going out with friends, mm-hmm. they don't really dress up. They dress up like, like a half button up shirt and shorts and, or like they just trying to go for that kind of so you would prefer to dress up to make a statement to make a statement and to like inspire people to dress in a certain style in a certain way so that way you can present yourself Mm -hmm. better and that's basically what a suit is is that it not only makes you look better it'll make you feel better it'll make you feel that you're comfortable and you're confident into what you're wearing no matter what you're doing do you feel it's easier to express yourself through your persona whether it's creatively or sexually uh that's a good question because since like uh since i'm a kind of a small account um i like i try to ex- the way i try to express the art that i commission is by saying that like mark himself has no uh preference which means that he's open to you know he's pretty much open to anyone just like how i am you know, I'm pretty much open to mm-hmm. to anyone as long as you have a good personality and you're nice, you know, just stuff like that. It's showing your willingness to explore and try new things. Exactly. So you're saying your it better than me. like enhances that ability for you. Yes. He's kind of extending an olive branch that I'm trying that I'm trying to make. Okay. What was your first exposure to the furry fan? Uh aside from the Disney movies? Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, besides that. <laughs> I guess would have to say uh this one video of these group of furs going to Las Vegas and just having just being two limousines and they're just having the time of their lives you know going to different hotels grabbing pictures and the background music is uh don't stop me now by queen and throughout the song like you know they're just Mm -hmm. they're all having a ball and then they're at the strip and they're like having a dance off with the street dancer and and I see, like, you know, all these group of fur, like, fursuiters. I'm just like, wow. Like, this looks like a really cool community. And they're dressing up in animal costumes. I dressed up in animal costumes when I was a kid. But they're doing it as an adult. And, they're, and it's not even Halloween. And that's what kind of <laughs> brought me into the furry fandom. So it was like a lot of excitement, fun surrounding it. And that just kind of drew you in. Yeah, and I saw more videos, and then I saw telephone videos, like Telephone Squeak. And, you know, I saw, like, how cute she was being and how amazing the reactions from the different people uh, were given her. Like, And I wanted to, to do that uh, for other people. I wanted to have that same reaction. And... I'm not, you know, like asking for attention or anything. I'm just, I, I want to give people that same, 
that same drive and that same commitment a telephone has for the other people. Hmm. So you want to be like the highlight of someone's day some somehow. Exactly. Like if I go to a convention and there's people who've never seen a furry before or for not a furry but like a fursuiter before and mm-hmm. and I'm their first experience and then they get all giddy and excited like like they're a kid again. Like they're seeing a whole different Disney character right in front of them. Hey, that's a like, good way of putting it. Yeah, because fursuiting is just another version of mascotting. You know, like you see your favorite mascot at a basketball game and then they actually come to you in the stands. Like you you feel giddy. You feel excited because your team's mascot is standing right next to you. And like you have no choice but to give them a hug. Have there been any obstacles in your life that you've had to overcome because of your outward appearance? There are uh, a couple. What's the biggest one that influenced you? Oh, God. Um, The biggest one that influenced me was overcoming my insecurities. Like, when when you're a big person like me, you know, not a lot of people look at you. You know, like, the girls that you're attracted to, you know, they don't really look your way because they're not that perfect you know rock hard body that they're looking for and Mm. you know i eventually overcame that and i feel a lot better now i still have a couple of those insecurities but i'm like i'm working on it and that was like the biggest thing i had to overcome and the the second biggest thing I had to overcome was realizing my how my skin color doesn't change how of what other people think. Like I can talk to you in the most professional way, but it still doesn't change that I'm black. Right. It's a detail some black folks would like to never have to confront. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they they don't. You know, they wish to not confront it, and half of them, you know, don't really see it or face it because, like, they still live in some of them, like, live in those top notch neighborhoods, but they they will face Mm -hmm. it one day. You know, it'll either be in high school or it could be at their, their first job or it could be when they, their first, when they first get pulled over by a police officer. You know, they will face it one day. What event made you confront it head on? Uh, There was one incident where I was driving and the officer pulled me over. He said I was speeding, but I was not. And And he asked me for my license and registration. I gave it to him and, you know... As as usual with what I've seen in videos, he had uh, he kept his hand on his gun. Because like I can understand, oh. yes, I can understand that you know the types of precautions that officers make. The thing is, the difference between being pulled over when you're black, and being pulled over when you're white, is that when you're being pulled over when you're white. You can just reach in your glove compartment and just pull out your registration. When you're black or like another skin color, you literally have to explain every single detail of where your hands are going. And gave him my registration paperwork and he says, we'll be back. He said, then he came back. He said I was speeding and I told him that I was not. And then he started getting confrontational with me, and he eventually told, asked me, like, um, am I on, like, do I have drugs hidden in my car? Do I have, you know, any oh type of, God. like, weapons or narcotics in, uh, like, in the trunk of my car or anything like that? And I said, I do not. And he says, like, well, I'm going to have to take a look to make sure. And... If I didn't take 
U.S. government in high school, I would not know my rights. And so I constantly told him, I was like, sir, you're invoking, you are violating my rights. I don't consent to the search. So whatever you find, I did not consent to. And he asked, and like he said, well, how am I supposed to know that if you don't have any narcotics if I don't look? And I told him that you don't need to know what you sh- what you do know is that I don't consent to the search. And how do I know that your body cam is not on? And you know he he was trying to defend himself and stuff like that. But I eventually called him out on the shit, and I told him just told him I wanted to speak to a supervisor, and I waited to speak to a supervisor. They gave me the ticket. I fought it in court. The ticket was non-valid. I did not speed. The uh, speedometer said that I was going at the right speed uh, limit, and the case was dropped. Wow. All that for no reason. No reason. Jeez. There was no reason for any of that to happen. There was no reason, yes, but it it doesn't change the fact how much power officers have, you know, over the people. And exactly. What? So like, I know a lot of good quotes from good movies. And one of the quotes that I learned was, have you seen the movie V? V for Vendetta? Oh, I should watch that. Because everybody uses the fox masks and whatnot. All right, so what V said after he explained that he was going to blow up Parliament, he said that people should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. And that is... Oh, I've heard that. That is what I want for us, is that the government should be afraid of what we can do not the other way around. Damn straight. It would be nice for them to be afraid again instead of shitting all over us all the time like we're (laughs) fucking dogs. Exactly. Not not to say people usually shit on their dogs. You know? (laughs) (laughs) You get what I mean. Just like, don't just don't take like you know a hot shit while we're while you're listening to this, please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel as though your family had a different lifestyle compared to other families? Oh, most definitely. Like my dad, he, um, like he's a hundred percent black, and he grew up in the Fillmore District in San Francisco, which is kind of like the ghetto. Um, and my mom, she grew up in, well, she was born and raised in, she was born in San Francisco and then raised in Tennessee for a few years. And then she moved, then her fam, like her, her mom, sister, and everyone else moved to Germany. And then they eventually moved back to the city into like a nice, you know, suburban neighborhood. And yeah. when th- when my mom and dad got together and they had me, my my family took me to Disneyland for the first uh, for the first time when I was eight months old. And my dad has never been to Disneyland in his whole life. And the way I grew up, which is like getting the best schools and everything, and being helped by my family who have their own businesses and stuff like that. Uh, I believe that the life I lived is a lot different from, you know, some of the other kids that I grew up with. What's the defining thing that made you feel like you're different? I guess when it came to me in high school is that I realized that I wasn't exactly like quote unquote acting my skin tone. 
I realized how different I was. I see. <laughs> what, uh, what would it be acting your skin tone in high school look like exactly? Uh, you know, just people talking, uh, talking, uh, the way they talk, like, hey, yo, what's up? Like, what's going on? So, like, they, they have that, that slang to them. And that's what most of the kids talk like in, in my high school. Even though it was a private school, they all still talked that way. And I realized that, and they were all, they were all like, you know, my skin color or even darker. And I realized that, oh, wow, this is different. Because like before high school, I grew up in like, kind of like white schools, so like white middle schools and elementary schools. Because like, I was pretty much like, the fourth black kid in those schools. But in in high school, oh. there was hundreds of them. And I didn't know what to do. That's when I realized, like, oh, wow, like, this is, like, I'm completely uh, out of my zone here. Like, I'm a, I'm a fish out of water. And that's what kind yeah, of... You're the odd one out. Exactly. That's what kind of alienated me in high school the only thing that kept me together was sports is there anything you've learned about yourself through your experiences in the furry fandom i learned i liked guys <laughs> okay that's a strong start all right yeah, yeah. i i didn't <laughs> i didn't realize until i actually started seeing some of the merch suiting stuff and yeah. so that was a pretty big surprise. Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> you just like days off thinking about guys mercuding? <laughs> Excuse <Yeah>. you, sir. <laughs> all right, all right. You can relive your, your euphoria another time. I'm asking if you... <laughs> You've learned anything about yourself through your experiences in the furry fandom? Uh, shit. I learned that I'm not the only one who has a big belly, and I learned that there are actually other people out there that like guys with bellies. Oh, that yeah. Apparently, like, oh, it's yeah. it's a kink for everyone now. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that, and so that made me a lot more comfortable. Man, I feel like I can't post a picture without someone being like, please crush me with your belly, daddy. So I can definitely see why you would have those kinds of experiences. Very eye-opening. Very. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever considered yourself to, in a sense, uh, be the only one, the odd one out when it comes to like furry fandom things? Do I ever feel like I'm the only one out? Yeah, when it comes to like furry stuff, because a lot of black and brown people feel like they're the only like little dot in a sea of white people. Mm. Well, being my my skin color, like before, um, you know, these uh poppy furs getting like a little bit more famous, I thought I was. And I pretty much am in this in my city, because I don't see a lot of uh I don't see a lot of furries out here in Solano Solano County, um or at least none that I know. And me neither. That's pretty much that's pretty much uh what makes me feel like I'm kind of alone. Uh, but then again, I see, you know, famous, uh, people that are furries that actually made it to, like, national news. Like Sonic Fox, for instance. Sonic Fox, mm -hmm. he's honestly one of the, the best gamers of his generation. 
in my opinion. He's pretty good. Because he's won... He's won many, like, Mortal Kombat tournaments. He's won many, like, Injustice and Injustice 2 tournaments. Like, basically a lot of fighting games. And he's and he's won so many tournaments. And, like, for me, he's an aspiring... Well, he's an inspiration to what a, a gamer and a furry would be. Hey y'all, looks like you're in pretty deep. Just wanted to let you know that you can follow us over on Twitter at what's the fuzz underscore and make sure to subscribe to us wherever you're listening. I hella suggest Pocket Cast to do so, and that way you'll be able to download the newest episodes as soon as they are posted. Alright, that's all I wanted to say. On with the show. Why was it important for you to get a fursuit or at least a partial? And who would you recommend it to if you had to? Like, what do you mean recommend? Like, who would I recommend getting a fursuit? Yeah. People that are, like, shy or something. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to get Mark because, uh, like I said earlier, like, I wanted to be the... I wanted to be the the person that I that I thought in my head. You know, I wanted everyone to have the same kind of reactions that I see in different first YouTube videos and I wanted to be accept uh, to be accepted uh into the you know, first food community or like just like the fur community in general. Do you feel there's a lot of negative stigma surrounding fursuits and furries in general? Uh, what do you mean by stigma? Like, people think that we're all, like, dirty, horny sex freaks, which we are, but... Shh. <laughs> like, what do I think about it? Do you feel like it's accurate? I want to say 40% no, 60% yes. Because when you when like when when people when people hear about the word furry, they either say like, "Oh, what's that?" Or something along the lines of, like, aren't those the ones who fuck each other in animal costumes? And it's just like, hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like you're... I, I, like, I, wh- wh- when I'm in public, I just say, like, no. But I mean, yes. <laughs> it's a yes and. Yeah, that, that puts you in a strange position being a, uh, a mercer to yourself, eh? Yeah, it kind of... Uh, puts me in the spotlight and i do my best to just think of the fandom as a whole not the community i'm a part of and i try to explain it to them uh that the community as a whole is wholesome the community itself is acceptable to any person and I also tell them that just like any other fandom, we do have a darker side. Like, if you go to a Comic Con, you won't ex- like. Would you not expect this Gramora to fuck Spider Man, like later on after the convention? It's the yeah, same. I'm gonna be thinking about that. Thank you for that. <laughs> Because it's the the same concept, you know. If you go to an anime convention, would you not expect Deku to have sex with uh, Tamari from like Naruto, like uh, because like they're attracted to each other? You oh know, it's goodness. it's the same way in the furry community. You know, like you we we have darker sides. What we choose to do with our fursuits 
is something that should be behind closed doors. Now, if they post it in in public, like um, like on Pornhub or X videos, those like it's their uh, it's their business. It's not. Yeah. It's not what I'm doing. It's just kind of part of human nature for people to like to dress up and have crazy sex, basically. Exactly. Like, like what? Um, like if I ask him, like, oh, like what's your kink? He's like, oh, like you like women in latex. So like, okay, that's a kink. You like women who have like stockings on. Okay, that's a kink. Like just because you like women with stockings on and nothing else. You think that women with stockings who just walk around because they want to look good, you think you know that they that they do that. True. And these people that do like Comic Con and stuff, if you say like you're a comic book nerd, no one's gonna be thinking about how you dress up as fucking Hermione Granger and fucking <laughs> yeah. fucking Voldemort. But, uh, <laughs> no, no. Why did you finish it? <laughs> But no, that's not on the front of their mind. So why is it when furries, when furries are brought up, that's at the front of the mind. That's that's all I'm saying. You know, nerds are sex deprived, lusty, hot and heavy, fully loaded. I don't know where I'm going with that anymore. I don't know. <laughs> so you get the point. <laughs> Has mercuding changed? Uh, the way that you feel about yourself or your body? It definitely helps me be more acceptable about my uh, my weight. You know, like the way my body is right now. You know, like a normal girl who would, you know, just would want like you know a certain boyfriend it, my body wouldn't match with that um but being in you know the ad community uh it definitely help uh helps me especially when i get you know random dms saying like i love your videos or like saying like the um saying you know like the way you are is just fine. Or if it's like seeing posts from like your you favorite validation. Yeah, validation. Especially like when you uh when different mercuders talk about, you know, how they love guys with bellies. And you know, it definitely helps me be a little bit more acceptable. like get to see a side of people that you otherwise wouldn't know is there and that mm -hmm. makes you feel better about who you are especially if it's especially if it's the suitors that are just drop down gorgeous like out of suit like if they look absolutely beautiful and they're their body is like that of like a, a Greek goddess, and then their face is um is close to the resemblance of Helen of Troy or, or like just some beautiful person. And they like guys who are like me. You know, that's an ego boost for any person, for any man. Or any woman. Absolutely. So do you ever feel as though people are projecting their insecurities onto you if and when they criticize what you're doing with your body? I just... The, way, the kind of person I am is that whatever insecurity you tell me like of, you know, like saying that like oh like your skin color is too too dark for me or like your 
your body is not what I want. You know, it it hurts like a little bit, but the way I take it is that I take it as a joke. You know, I see the the funnier side of it because I'm because I've accept uh, I've accepted my body. I'm just like, oh, no, nah, you're right. It's like I I am a little chubby. It's like, yeah, I do got, you know, a a belly. Like just because it's not a six pack doesn't mean, you know, I'm not gonna get any girls or like gonna get any guys. Because I know now that there exactly. are actually people out You're there. Just another flavor of ice cream. Yeah. Like I know people out there that are into it. So like just because you're not into it doesn't mean other people aren't into it. When you think of diversity in the furry fandom, what comes to mind first? I'm gonna have to say I'm gonna have to say the dance competitions. Like there's a lot of diversity in the dance competitions. Because, like, you have a lot of, you know, people of color and, uh, and like, white people coming together. They're all, <clears throat> they're all there to dance and to show what they can do. I think that's, like, the most diverse thing that we, that the community does as a whole, along with uh, gaming. Because... When it comes to like fursuit parties or raves at, in the cons, it's very yeah. Uh, it's very one sided, you know, because the only way for you to get into a you no know, a room party is to be invited. And to be invited, you need to talk to certain people, and not and they're not always talkative, you know, for those people. Especially when you're like a, if you're a person of color, whether you whether you look like it or you just seem like it, you know, and then they they won't ignore you; they'll just engage with you for like a second or two and then they'll walk away. Hmm. So when, it's like there's more closed doors than open doors for BIPOC at these cons. In a way, yes. Is that, that's why like last year you I'm pretty sure you've seen um posts of like let's like let's have like uh, an all people of color party. Like, if you're a person of color, you're automatically invited to the, uh, to the party. Or, like, having, like, mm -hmm. an all black yeah, or, like, all that. Mexican. No, I don't 100% agree with just, like, only blacks and only Mexicans and, like, only Asians at, like, these certain parties, but I do agree for a people of color party. No, when it comes to yeah. the when it comes to the raves, uh, God, there isn't a lot of diversity in the songs the raves, because it's all, it's all dubstep. It's all, um, like techno music. You won't, you like, you'll hardly find, uh, songs in, at like the con raves, like um. Like you know, baby got back. Like by by Sir Mix a lot. You won't have something like like two step by Unk. You know, just like dancing songs. You know, not not yeah, songs that you can jump up to and the down Humpty to. Hump. Yep. Yeah. Or like the Tootsie Roll. <laughs> See, like those I are vibe with you. Those are dances, though. Those are something yeah, that you can dance to that everyone can dance to but when it comes to like when it comes to the raves that only has techno and uh and dubstep music 
Like, what is there to dance to? What beat do I go off of? Like, yeah, like, yeah, there's... it's just kind of like jumping up and down, like, listening to noise, right? Like... Yep. That's all there is. And the people who do dance to it, you know, it's... Like, yeah, like, good for you. Like, I'm... I'm clapping for you because like you know how to you know how to dance. But for me, for the ones who the person who like grew up with like mostly you know around you know black people music, you know, I only know, you know, the the nene or like the cat daddy, you know, just those kinds of of dances. And when that comes on, I'll go off. I'll go off. But when it's when it's like techno and and dubstep music, I don't know what to do. I'll jump up and down, but like I can't, I can't do that for like two, three hours. Like, like th- then like, okay, I'll, yeah, like no. I'll pull a hamstring. I don't want to pull a hammy while just like <laughs> dancing. At least like I'll, I'll if if I'm gonna pull a hammy when I'm dancing, I want it to like look good. Not because yeah, I'm and jumping then on up top of that, I've heard that they're not even allowed to play that kind of music. Like it's against the rules, even. Yeah, because it's too provocative. <laughs> provocative? And... Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> Furries being provocative. I mean, come on, There's guys. No such thing. There's no such thing as like furries dressing up in booty shorts and short skirts and mint and dresses to go to that rave. It's not Furries like having literal sex in the lobby. What? No. Uh... No. And like people are actually checking your ID to see if you're 18 in order for you to get into the rave. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Sure. But uh, as I was saying, right, the uh, people have they know these songs and they feel like they're welcome when they be when they hear them. Exactly because when, those when you are just have the songs. Like, that when you they have like nonstop with. noise to them, it sounds like. Just noise. Or you know maybe this song is okay, but after that I'm out. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, a small step towards building that diversity that everybody wants. Like the dancing competitions is the foot in the door. We need to open the whole door. Right. Because when you when you actually like see. The, the dancers, like the first two dancers, not a lot of them go to the raves. You know, because like even the ones who aren't competing, because they can't dance to those songs. You know, like the songs that they dance to, like they're the ones that uh that they've grew up like dancing to like in in their rooms or like in front of a mirror. And that's what we all did. You know, like I, uh, I like I like occasionally hit the rolly, you know, to see if I actually still got it. You know, like when I'm in, you no, know, when I'm dancing in front of my uh, mirror, and I want to be able to do that at a con, like at a con rave. But how can I do that when the song will never come on? You know, how can I do it when the DJs don't even have it in their playlists? Or, like, the higher-ups, the ones who actually, like, made the convention happen, when they don't allow that kind of music at their cons? I like that line. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in my pocket. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Do you feel the fandom lives up to being open and accepting as it claims to be? That's a good question. It's getting to that point. You know, um, we are really accepting. You know, we're very open, you know, especially if you have, you know, mental disabilities or physical disabilities. That doesn't stop you from being in the furry fandom. But that can also isolate you once you're in a convention, you know? Like yeah, like you can, like they stop, like you can, 
stop a first suitor and then they can take a picture and stuff, but they won't hang out with you. Unless, like, they actually know them. You know? Uh, and if you're, like, a person of color, yeah, you're accepting. But that doesn't get you, that doesn't automatically get you into uh, the friend circle. Even if you, like, came up to me and we're talking. Well, just say, like, oh, I'll see you around, and then you'll never see him again. And when you see them again, and you try to hmm. talk to them, he's like, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, they, like, he won't introduce you to your, to their other friends. It was just like, oh, this is the person I just met, so there's, like, earlier. So there's, like, a disconnect between surface level nicey nice and then like actual genuine friendliness and warmth that you would expect from someone to come from a quote unquote um accepting fandom. Exactly. Because when it comes to when it comes down to it, the community as a whole wants to be as perfect as possible. And you can see it. You can see that they're trying to be as perfect as possible. You know, like, oh, like, we're accepting all walks of life, all genders, all sexualities, all types of disabilities. But that's not what they truly feel. That's what they're portraying themselves as on social media. Yeah, it's like having a husband that says that he's going to do better, and he just dresses nicer. He doesn't actually consider if you wanted to go to dinner, or what movie that you wanted to watch, or just things that you want or feel like you're missing out on in the relationship. He's willing to make other amends that have no impact on his own comfort but if he has to go out of his way to make you feel comfortable or cared for it becomes an issue I couldn't have said it better myself so the things that these fur cons should maybe, maybe look into not just say that people with disabilities are accepted Maybe implement uh, ramps for folks with wheelchairs. I saw people um, on Twitter. They were commenting on how they have these little these little individual dome things for like concerts, with like a step up there. So people have like their own personal space. Maybe something like that for people with like anxiety or something. Like, just, like, quiet spaces for them to collect themselves, maybe? Just small things that help folks assimilate to enjoy an event differently, but together, in a sense. I think that's a good idea. I think that's something that people should really look into. Uh, It's... It's difficult um, to find a place for people with anxiety to go to because when you when you're having an anxiety attack, you kind of want to like isolate yourself. It's hard to isolate yourself when you have other people that are having an anxiety attack in the same room. Yeah, you know, so I think like it's like we should have yeah, like a it room just builds that's, on itself. Yeah, and that's not what you want when you're having a panic attack. So I think like when you have like they should have a room where they have, you know, curtains and like different, you know, parts of the room and then you can hide behind that curtain and then collect your thoughts cuz like you're in a dark space and like there's no one around you. Exactly. And it's not easy to implement these things but 
mm-hmm. if the fandom wants to call itself the the welcoming, accepting, all genders, all races, ooh woo, ah wah 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 wah, or whatever the fuck, um, it should start actually caring about the people in the fandom mm-hmm. beyond the people that are able bodied or white or have money. That's why it's that's why it's kind of funny. Like they say, like, oh, like we welcome all races and genders and disabilities, but once you're actually in the fandom, they're just saying good luck. <laughs> just a slap on the ass and a spit on your wrist. Yep. I don't know where that <laughs> like, second part came the... from, but I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a king somewhere <laughs> out there. All right. All right, we don't need to get back into that. (laughs) How do you feel when you see furries that think of themselves as being kind or friendly, sending death threats to BIPOC creators for criticizing things like the documentary The Fandom for having a lack of diversity, or even HMFF, HMHF, for striving to have an all BIPOC brand for comedy? I think it just shows them who they truly are, how they truly feel. You know, um, when they when they make posts for their fans, it's always so accepting and so open. But when they see a post that doesn't actually like really agree with their agenda, then their true colors come out. And they don't think about what they write. You know, it's just like, oh no, it's like cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you think that um some some popufers who are you know true like who we truly know as popufers that make wholesome content and like for everyone to listen to, but when you see the kind of the kind of um, stuff they reply to, when you see the kind of messages that you uh, that they write on Telegram, you know you can see that they're an entirely different person because that is part of uh, portraying yourself as a better person in social media. But on the inside, you're just you're on the inside. You're different. Like you're someone that won't be accepting in the community. Do you think it has to do with the environment or colorblind racism? I think it has to do with. <clears throat> with them not truly seeing how severe it is because of their upbringing, because of how they grew up. Because I have, like, my aunt's boyfriend, he is, uh, he's an EMT, and he has uh, friends that are cops. And his views Mm -hmm. are entirely biased towards the officers because of what he grew up with and what he uh, of like who he worked with as an EMT and you can see like how biased it is and no matter how many times that me or like my mom try to explain you know what his bias is it's hard to change it because that's what he grew up uh, listening to, what he grew up seeing, and what he grew, like what he seen while he was working, and like who he was around with. And I think you know because the fandom has such a young group, you know, because the the average furry ranges between sixteen to twenty one. You can see that, like, they haven't fully grown up yet. That they still have their biases. And, 
we and like that's kind of what uh goes on in the fandom is that the people like even people who are between 25 and 35 and that that's even like less of an excuse because they should know what kind of bias that they're talking about but they don't see it that way they just see it as their quote unquote opinion so it's difficult to gain what it looks like from the other side because they're so wrapped up in what they already have lodged inside of them. Precisely. Because if I grew up um, being told that that Native, uh, Native Americans were like the cause of like of plague and disease and like and I grew up saying that like I should learn to stay away from Native Americans but then I don't think that way and when I actually you know spend time with Native Americans or when I'm around them I still have that that bias is like I don't like I myself personally don't know how hard Native Americans have because of the stuff I grew up listening to so whenever I whenever people say you know like oh Native American lives matter and I say like well why don't all lives matter you know, yes, like Native Americans, they have it hard, but other people have it hard too. Because I myself did not does like did not see how hard Native Americans had because I was not in their shoes. And so that's the same thing when it comes to why people saying all lives matter when they realize the kind of racism and bias stuff that's going on with black people. That's why I think that instead of bothering um, your one black friend or whatever the fuck, it's a good idea to listen to things like these to gain that kind of perspective. Because even through just doing these interviews, I never knew how white the fandom was. I never knew how unwelcoming it could be. I didn't even know that uh, they had restrictions on music until I started doing this show, and I I understood why there needs to be a BIPOC Rand Furcon, why it matters, Mm -hmm. and how things are changing ever so slowly for the better, and why we need to keep going in the direction we're going in and not to look back. Just throw out the trash, keep going, keep telling people what's up and why black lives matter and why black lives matter should matter to furries, no matter what. No matter what. If you're going to be, if you're saying to be all accepting, then be all accepting. Don't just, you know, say... That you know you, that we accept everyone when everyone doesn't want to accept you. I think we're coming up on the last question I got for you. Okay. Well, second to last, actually. I'm sorry. I lied. What would you like <laughs> to see the furry fandom change by this time next year? What would make you the happiest to see? Post more black music in, uh, you know, in DJ playlists, like when the cons open back up. I think that would be a huge impact because it'll give people more diversity when it comes to dancing. You don't always have to rely on the dances that you learned online or like dances that you learned in, you know, by yourself or like by a tutor. 
but dance to the music that just feels right. It feels right for you, or like just dance to the music that they tell you to. That the music is literally just telling you how to dance. So I think like adding black music or like just diverse music in general to to like DJ playlists. I think that would be that's what I hope that they would add in the near future, especially by next year. Hell yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with a little hustle hustle. Hey. Hey. <laughs> All right, the real last question is, was there anything in this interview that you wish that I'd asked about? You asked more Disney questions? <laughs> oh my gosh. You got enough points in the lightning round at the start. I, I, I don't know, think but I I'm have competitive. I like, I like a lot of Disney questions. <laughs> okay, okay. How about, um, how old is Alice in Alice of Wonderland? Oh, shit. Uh, I think she was like 14. You know, she's she's between 11 and 14, so I'll give it to you. Yes! <laughs> Okie dokie. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Mark. I really think I understand what's going on with the furry community and how we can better it for the future. Oh, thanks for right. Thanks for having me. You know, this is definitely something that i needed like you know because it's nice to like talk to somebody that you know is able to listen and then i can just get the stuff off my chest you know because you know with being a small account not a lot of people will listen so i'm glad that you know have being on this kind of podcast or like just this interview is is like it really helps me oh definitely I want everybody to get their chance. If they have something to say, they should be given the chance to say it. Hey guys out there, don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening to, and check us out on Twitter at what's the fuzz underscore. Mark, you got the spotlight. Go ahead and promote anything you like. Uh, just uh, make sure to give me a follow uh, on my either on my AD account, uh, Mark underscore the AD, or um, my SFW account for those of you who are, um, no, for those of you who are underage but still listen to the podcast, as Mark uh, Suit, and you know, make sure to give this channel a follow. follow. You know, like this is an amazing uh, interview. Uh, I've been asked like amazing questions, and I guarantee that. You know, no one will have the same answer, so just keep listening and see what you know these other people have to say. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.